Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, us for this call titled When We Take Power with our guests Leo Panich and Sam Gindin, the authors of The Socialist Challenge Today. Uh, so my name is William and I am on the National Political Education Committee and also a member of Omaha, Nebraska DSA. Um, so with this talk, uh, we have been noticing that there are quite a few DSA candidates uh, across the country that are running for office, and many of them are actually winning their positions, are winning their elections. Um, and we felt that it was imperative that we as socialists contend with the question of state power and the responsibilities of socialists to transform the state um, and the relationship between the socialist movement and socialists actually in government. Uh, as we pursue these types of electoral projects. So I'm really excited that you could join us all for this talk today. So we have a few housekeeping items to get start, uh, get into before we get started. So uh, on the bottom of Zoom, you have the Q&A function to submit questions. During the last 25 minutes or so of this talk, um, uh, you are welcome to la ask Leo and Sam any questions that you like, and we're going to be like sorting through them and picking out some good questions uh, for the ending Q&A se section. So just remember, you could drop those questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. Um, you can get a copy of the Socialist Challenge today from Haymarket Books. I have my prop copy here that you could actually read, I guess. Um, and we're going to post a link in the chat for where you can get your own copy of this book that Leo and Sam base their talk off of. And we also just wanted to give a big thanks to Haymarket Books for their support of this talk and DSA's ongoing political education efforts. They've been really helpful working with our committee to get us in touch with authors like Leo and Sam. Um, so to introduce some of the things that we were thinking about when uh, we were developing this event was the National Political Education Committee actually read uh, this book together, some of our members did, and we had a discussion about some of the political content in it, and we came up with what we felt like were some really good takeaways that were important to the socialist movement in America, um, particularly what is, what are different theories on the role of the state? How would you describe this relationship between the state and the working class? How do socialists determine whether particular policies serve our long, our long-term politics? And how do we build a socialist party that's necessary to challenge the state, state and capital on top of what is our responsibilities as socialists to foster democracy, not just in our own organizations, but you know, kind of in society as a whole. Um, so these were the questions that we were thinking about as we worked through the book, and uh, they kind of helped Leo and Sam guide the talk that they're about to give. So now uh, I'm going to hand it over to Leo and Sam. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, Sam and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to the DSA uh, around the themes of this book. In, and it's very gratifying to hear that the National Political Education Committee read it, took it seriously, uh, and, and are sponsoring this to the wider membership because the purpose of writing the book, uh, especially producing this second edition that Haymarket has brought out, was precisely to try to reach the activists in the DSA. Uh, to try to think through with them strategically uh, what this remarkable political moment uh, amounts to uh, for uh, socialist prospects. The timing is also good. I mean, obviously, Haymarket wanted to get the book out before uh, Sanders was defeated, uh, wanted to get out as part of the campaign to win Bernie the nomination. But in a certain sense, it is better, more apt, that we're having this discussion with that, all, that opportunity already having passed, although by no means, as William was just pointing out, does it mean that D DSA members won't be elected at all kinds of other levels of the state. Um, but what it allows us to do, 
is to draw long-term lessons from short-term disappointments. Uh, and in a sense, that's what we were trying to do when we wrote this in the wake of the disappointment with Syriza's government, uh, which was elected in 2015, and which by the end of June 2015 uh, proved such a disappointment for the Greek and the international left. Um, it was always clear to us that the issue was less whether Corbyn would enter number 10 uh, and bring about a revolution on the day after he did so in Britain, or whether Sanders would win the nomination. And it was always more likely that he could win the presidency than win the Democratic Party nomination. Uh, it, 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 it was a matter of trying to think through the disappointments that would come, uh, whether they were successful or not successful. Um, and, and the point of pointing to the limitations so far was not to put the blame uh, on Sanders or Corbyn or the, the, the movement behind them, as we did not, ins we insisted against much of the international left, not putting the blame on Syriza, uh, but rather to try to think through how to build on, despite the disappointments, what had happened, and expand the possibilities by learning the lessons from the limitations. Uh, that led to the disappointments. Um, it is a matter of what happens when you enter the state for what the DSA represents, and it, it was very right to pose the questions that way. But we would strategically want to insist that policy, the radicalism of policy, is only one element in this. The ambition of policy uh, is only one element in this. Uh, probably less important than the question of how do you change the apparatuses of the state to implement that policy uh, in a way that matches its ambition, but much more important, how once you're in the state do you continue to build, indeed expand the building of popular democratic capacities outside the state? Uh, Bernie put it very well when he described himself as he would be organizer in chief. But what does that actually mean? Uh, and and uh, that's what we we're trying to address uh, and would really love to discuss with you. Um, just in a preliminary way, uh, I'd want to say that in Sam's and my view, the key thing now at this moment of disappointment, if you want to put it that way, uh, is not to squander what has already been put in place. And I think that applied as much as to Syriza as it does now to Momentum and the World Transformed in Britain and to the DSA uh, uh, and, and associated uh, organizations around Sanders uh, in the United States. Uh, what the DSA has come to represent what momentum has come to represent for all of its limitations and what Syriza as a party uh, came to represent uh, was something that had not been seen for at least three generations. Uh, and I would, I would say almost anywhere. Uh, and that is the revival of a socialist discourse, a creative socialist discourse in towards the sec end of the second decade of the 21st century, uh, when that socialist discourse had been marginalized uh, for upwards of half a century. Secondly, the recognition on the po part of those who embraced socialist ambitions and the socialist discourse, that the first barrier to putting democratic socialism on the agenda in a serious way did not lie with the bourgeoisie, with the ruling class. The first barrier did not lie with the agencies of the state, whether the agencies of representation or repression. The first barrier lay in the parties that claimed to speak for uh, the working classes, that is, parties like the Labour Party uh, and, and the Democratic Party. That was the first barrier that needs to be overcome. 
uh, and that's obviously uh, still the case in light of what has happened uh, with uh, Corbyn and Sanders, and with, with indeed what Sam and I would call the social democratization of the Syriza leadership. Um, the third aspect of what is so remarkable uh, about uh, what has happened and why uh, this must become a legacy we build on is that it represents a very important and creative break with the Bolshevik model. Uh, the cadre, those who, who retain a socialist perspective uh, through the long dark decades from the 60s uh, until the present, uh, were very often people who embraced a language that still echoed with the phrases of the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution uh, and still uh, inherently operated with a strategy that was oriented to a notion of insurrectionary revolution. And what has happened with uh, you folks, if I may say so, it seems to me, uh, is that for the most part, you've retained a attachment to the spirit of the 1917 revolution while uh, divesting the left, finally, of this arcane language uh, and a strategy which Gramsci already pointed out uh, by 1920 was inadequate uh, for almost every state uh, which did not disintegrate of itself as the Russian Tsarist state did. Uh, and then finally, uh, it seems to us that, that what was broken with as well, uh, and this is what Sam and I have called for a long time the shift from protest to politics, was the very understandable anar anarchism that motivated and defined so much of the remarkably important protest movement uh, at the beginning of the millennium, above all the anti-globalization movement. It was understandably anti-party. It was understandably attracted by slogans like changing the world without taking power. In light of the tremendous disappointment of communist parties and social democratic parties, not to speak of the democratic party in the States or the liberal party in Canada, um, uh, understandably, there was a rejection of electoralism, of party politics, of, of entering the state. Uh, the way in which so creatively uh, the young people who entered the DSA turned it from an organization whose average age was my age to an organization whose average age is now, what, 30, maybe younger, um, was uh, that you retained I think much of the spirit of that, that mobilization, uh, that mobilization of protest, but you carried further in a very practical strategic way, the uh, moment of Occupy's identification of class as the central issue, 99% to 1% in that very crude class map. Um, and, and you channeled that into the question again, as your questions posed it tonight, of how do we get into the state? What do we do inside the state? And how do we behave inside the state in a way that builds popular democracy and popular capacities uh, uh, while we're in the state? Uh, since so getting into the state is not the end point. All of this needs to be put in historical perspective. And I'll try to do that very, very briefly. Uh, a century ago, at the time of the previous global pandemic, uh, at the time of uh, the Russian Revolution, at the time of the massive repression of the flowering of American socialism in the second decade of the 20th century, from Debs running for the presidency to there being mayors in uh, one horse towns in Oklahoma who were socialists, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, a century ago, uh, not only parties which were oriented to insurrectionary revolution, 
But even those who were oriented to gradual reform uh, spoke in terms of a socialist transition from capitalism. Uh, and, and socialism was conceived almost universally at that time uh, as representing, channeling working class formation uh, as the key to this transformation, to this shift from a capitalist system to a socialist one. The recovery of this perspective in the 21st century uh, if it's going to be sustained, needs to be clear about how and why those who conceived political strategy that way in the early part of the 20th century came to lose that perspective, how that came to be lost, uh, and why it had to be discovered again uh, in the second decade of the 21st century. Uh, you know, it's a long story. You really need to trace it from the Chartists in the 1830s uh, through the creation of mass trade unions and mass socialist parties by 1920, uh, or at least by the 1930s in the American case. Uh, and, and it largely was summed up rightly in the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels when they said that the first task of all communists is to organize the workers into a class organize the proletariat into a class and consequently into a political party to the end of establishing a worker state. But it was already clear once those mass socialist parties had been established between 1880 and 1920 uh, that a lot of those formulations were problematic, not least of which was the very concept of a worker state although even the bourgeoisie took that concept very seriously at the time. It meant something to them. It's not clear what it means to us today, and it would be worth discussing uh, whether that's a phrase that should be revived. Um, and, and, you know, what was problematic was that so many of the organizations of the working class at the industrial level were not socialist, and this was not only true in the United States, it was true much more broadly, Secondly, that the socialist parties, which had founded themselves on the working class, and in most cases in Europe had actually been central to the organization of the unions, the party came before often union organizations, uh, had already exhibited uh, the tendency that Roberto Michels identified by 1915, uh, which was this tendency to a uh, sharp divorce between the leadership and the left. Uh, with the leadership having come out of the base, not wanting to go back to the base should they lose their position, whether inside the state as party representatives or as party officials, and lots of evidence of control by the leadership uh, to their own benefit of party conferences, party newspapers, party funds, uh, et cetera. Uh, beyond that, uh, of course, the Russian Revolution, in democratic terms, disappointed. Of course, it inspired a great many people, but it also disappointed very quickly insofar as the encirclement by capitalist powers after the revolution, uh, the chaos during the revolution, the civil war, led to the Bolshevik party uh, uh, displacing the class. As Rosa Luxemburg put it, it became a clique affair. A cadre, a very committed and talented cadre, which was acting in the name of the class, but was not representing the class, but it has, could have cut away the channels of democratic representation. Uh, that didn't mean, and, and then there, you know, one needed to add to that, of course, that social democratic parties, the mass socialist parties uh, that did get elected in the 1920s and 1930s, while retaining a commitment to socialism, retaining a class perspective, often proved so disappointing uh, in terms of what we said were the main tasks, which is changing the very nature of the state uh, and continuing to develop the 
democratic capacities of the people who put them there. And in all those senses, the parties elected in uh, Germany, in Austria, uh, in Britain, in the 1920s and 1930s were extremely disappointing and, and demobilizing. Uh, it, it was on that basis that uh, when they were able to secure a more stable hold in the state, still on the basis of their ability to represent the class, the salience of a politics based on the working class was seen through the industrialization of the Soviet Union and through the development of the Keynesian welfare state by social democratic parties. Uh, but what was also seen was what was lost by virtue of the compromise that was made with capitalist classes, or in the Soviet case, was made with bureaucratic cadre. Uh, what was lost was uh, the, any capacity for those parties, both communist parties and social democratic parties, by the 1950s and 60s, to be seen as agencies of socialist transformation any longer. They really didn't see themselves as that any longer. Uh, the communists still spouted the rhetoric, uh, but it, it, it's hard to believe they really uh, believed it. Uh, and, and it was clear, therefore, to Sam's and my generation, to the generation of the new left, uh, that those parties were no longer going to be able to carry forward the strategic perspective uh, that we're talking about in this book. That led to various attempts uh, from the new left to go into those parties and make them socialist again in the sense that we're speaking of. Uh, with the Benite uh, campaign for Labour Party democracy, with the Meidner plan in Britain, uh, with the movement for independent socialist Canada, in the New Democratic Party, uh, with those who were expelled uh, from the German Social Democratic Party in the early 1970s, the youth wing that was trying to do this and went on to form the Green Party. All of those were defeated uh, uh, by the early 1980s, if not earlier. There was also the, some of people uh, to try, were trying to do that in the Democratic Party from 1968 to 72 in the United States. Uh, they were all defeated. But what happened in the context of that development was a re-theorization of strategy by a new generation of Marxist socialist theorists, which has left an important legacy. Uh, whether they were Euro-communists associated with the communist parties, whether they were disenchanted social democrats, uh, uh, what they began to think through was what Gortz called a strategy for structural reform. That is, taking elections seriously, trying to get into the state, uh, understanding that one wasn't going to transform the state by smashing it with a hammer uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, passing over to some imaginary dual power outside of the state but really trying to think through a strategy for the type of reforms that would open themselves up to further reforms because they created popular ambitions and popular capacities for going further to eventually take capital away from capital, uh, to take control of the state away from technocrats and the bureaucracy. Uh, what we were not able to do uh, was to found new parties that uh, uh, could do mass parties that could do this. There were, of course, people from the new left who went off to found a better Leninism. Uh, and and uh, it was only, you know, through the failures of those parties to become mass parties through the 1980s and 1990s uh, that one could see that uh, there was no way forward there. Uh, and it's kind of been underlying now by the implosion of the ISO in the United States and what's happened to the SWP and so on. And some of those very good cadre who were involved in that were important in coming together to form a party like Syriza, uh, 
uh, with Eurocommunists at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, but what you folks have come to represent is the first mass embodiment of the kind of thinking that came, strategic thinking, that creatively came to the fore when it became clear in the 60s that the old parties were no longer capable of being agencies of transformation. And what is more, uh, what's been shown is that the politics that is going to change that can as much take place through inside struggles within social democratic parties or even the democratic party in the United States without having any illusions that that will not lead if it's successful to an utter transformation after considerable division of those parties. And, you know, what you represent is every bit as radical as those parties that emerged by a coalescing of forces uh, in the context where you had proportional representation uh, in, in Europe, like Podemos or Dolinka or Syriza, who are now all in coalition governments with center-left social democratic parties, or as you could even say center-right social democratic parties. Okay, I'll stop there and pass it on to Sam. I, I would just like to say that uh, what the lesson we drew from Syriza uh, and that we wanted to apply when we were looking at what was happening with Corbyn and Sanders was that uh, Syriza was fine on policy, but it get, spent virtually no in, attention, gave no attention to how to implement policy. Yes, they wanted to bring honest technocrats into the state rather, you know, because they knew how many people were corrupt in the Greek state. But the question of how you would actually implement policy inside that state was given virtually no attention. Nor was much attention given to how do we keep the party a mobilizing, educating, strategic force while we're inside the state even though there was a lot of lip service to don't just send us into the state, we need your pressure behind us, et cetera. How actually to do that was not a subject of hardly any discussion. One has to say that the social movements, which were very massive in Greece, uh, uh, much more than Occupy, uh, themselves were not engaged in constructive mobilization vis-a-vis -vis the series of government. They would protest, but in terms of putting forward uh, their own strategies and ideas for transforming the state, whether at the local level, whether particular uh, state departments that they needed services from, they didn't see that as their responsibility. So it was very important that the movements that produced Corbyn and Sanders emerged in 2015 and 2016 after the disappointment with Syriza. What it showed was that that was not necessarily demobilizing. And the question we need to put to ourselves is, okay, now that we've had this experience with Corbyn and, and Sanders, what do we need to learn from them now? And I'll leave Sam to draw those lessons. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, I'm gonna to speak to some of the policies that came out of uh, the Corbyn and uh, Sanders moments. And I wanna to speak to their limits and then propose some alternatives in terms of taking them in somewhat different directions, but especially in terms of building on them. And like Leo, I'm doing this not so much in a sense of uh, judging what's happening, as soberly assessing it so we can learn and uh, take it for, uh, further. I wanna start with just uh, a couple of points about the context, this uh, really difficult complexity of trying to make socialism because of uh, all the uncertainties, because we're really inventing things that uh, haven't been invented. Uh, and that's absolutely critical to keep remembering. Uh, one point is that revolutions are always premature. They happen before we're quite ready. 
uh, not only is capital still there, uh, but the state uh, doesn't have the kind of capacities because it's developed capacities to run and respond to a capitalist economy that we would need. The kind of capacities for planning, for uh, uh, democratic planning in particular, just aren't there. They have to be invented. And uh, last but not least, the working class itself is likely, even when we come to office with their support, to be a mixed bag of people who want some immediate gains uh, and people who have a deep commitment to socialism. So those are the kinds of things we have to deal with. Part of that is that the situation we're in is that giant steps are essential or seem essential uh, to really cope with everything uh, in capitalism to, to change it effectively, but they're not possible. We don't have the capacities to implement the political capacities and the technical capacities in some sense to implement them. So we're, so we're left with small steps, but of course small steps can be swallowed up by the system. So we have to deal with that dilemma. And there's a dilemma that Leo raised about, we're talking about a long-term process that we wanna continue, but which may be interrupted. Uh, and there's always the pressures to meet immediate demands. You've got elections coming, uh, you've got uh, workers who want immediate demands, but those immediate demands can't, can only be met to a certain degree. So there's always this question of the long-term process that we have to gain people's commitments to. And uh, crucially, the point that Leo made about Syriza, this dilemma between having to govern uh, when that itself is difficult uh, because of the opposition and because of the uh, capacities you have at the time, and also organize at the same time. And it's especially difficult because there is a bias for the people who are more interested in governing, who have the resources and the legitimacy of weight we have to be elected uh, to have much more weight. So you need a party that is really thinking about, well, how do we really come through on this question of organizing? And the most important point, which I, I just want to reemphasize, which Leo uh, highlighted a couple of times, but it's the most important strategic question, which is that lists of policies are one thing, uh, but the real question is how do we build the kind of social force that can make, materialize uh, those policies? How do we develop the capacities, the understandings, the coherence of the class, its organization, its organizational capacities, its strategic capacities, its confidence. Uh, and at the same time, that is linked to transforming the state to support that, but also to push for the transformation of the state. So let me get into the policies. Uh, the policies, uh, all kinds of uh, very important and good policies, especially this uh, rejection of neoliberalism and raising expectations for something better uh, was obviously uh, a crucial um, and, and winning reforms. But I think the most important questions that were asked in terms of policies were how do we actually democratize capital? How do we take control over capital when we can't do it in one shot? Uh, how do we deal with the question of decent jobs um, and the environmental question, uh, the Green New Deal? Those were kind of central uh, tenets that had to be addressed. And this came out in terms of uh, the, de the, the democratic question, in terms of uh, having workers sit more on boards, uh, having workers get more shares, uh, supporting co-ops and other forms of uh, uh, worker ownership, uh, breaking up banks, uh, looking to pension fund socialism, where we just take the assets and pension funds, and that should give us the, resor the, the resources and the finance uh, to do what we'd like to do. And then of course, uh, the Green New Deal is, as a catch-all for all kinds of things. Now the limits on all of these, uh, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through them briefly. Uh, the, the limits of thinking in terms of workers sitting on boards is that corporations are much more complicated uh, than just whoever sitting on the board has the power. It's, it's a dense structure of power, and there's very little in the capacities that workers have developed under capitalism, which is one of the critiques of capitalism, that they can just walk in 
and take that over even if they're sitting on the board, uh, given what power really means within a major corporation. Uh, second of all, the question of shares as, as well doesn't get to the issue of real control. And most important is the fact that you have to look at the context of all of this. If this is still happening in a context where competition rules, then you're inevitably going to be putting the same kind of pe competitive pressures on workers. There's going to be pressures on them to identify with their own company. Uh, you're going to be fragmenting them uh, alongside in terms of different workers who are in different situations and maybe getting higher shares or lower shares. And there's a danger of the workers actually being more integrated into their firms than signif significantly challenging them. And I'd really stress in that this question of competitiveness, which I don't think that when the left thinks about class, it thinks about class power, but it doesn't think about the fact that it isn't just a question of capital and labor. It's also the way uh, the whole structure that both capital and labor uh, fit into is based on competition and how uh, crucial that is in shaping things. And the same is true of breaking up the banks. Uh, when, when you talk about breaking up the banks, what you're pointing to is, well, maybe we'll all be better off if we have smaller banks that are competing with each other. Not only is there a question of whether that would be stable or whether that wouldn't just lead to uh, banks uh, amalgamating again, but it's the question of, that's not the issue. The issue is making banks into a public utility. It isn't a question of breaking them up. In the question of pension fund socialism, uh, there's a problem that workers who happen to have pension funds, which isn't a majority, uh, might not be very happy about the monies they put into pension funds through uh, postponed wages would, would be used for general social purposes. So at a minimum, what you'd have to address is why just look at pension fund socialism? Why not put a levy on all financial institutions in the economy with the idea that workers that way would see the monies they put in leveraged, and then you would have some control over the pension funds, but you'd also have to ask uh, about the relationship of pension funds to finance. If the point of really making a break, if, if the point is really to make a break, then you really have to think about uh, not handing these funds over to finance, but thinking of an alternative to financial, in, financial institutions. Uh, the Green New Deal, and I'll come back to, to some of this labor later, but uh, you know, the, the environmental movement deserves enormous uh, credit for having gotten the environment on the agenda and for having an ambitious program of a new green deal that uh, covers not just uh, jobs and uh, addressing the environment but doing it in a way that is uh, egalitarian. Uh, that is crucial. The problem is that to tell workers that there will be a just transition is too vague. It doesn't engage them. It sounds like an abstract slogan. They don't see how you're actually going to implement them uh, because we're generally, when we're talking about a Green New Deal and we're trying to get a mass base for it, we're not explicitly addressing the fact that this is going to require major planning and it's going to require a, a major challenge to private property. Um, in addition to those uh, limits, there's a general limit about not taking on finance. If finance is free to move, they ultimately are going to uh, can undermine what we're doing. It shifts the balance of power too profoundly. And so this question of uh, capital controls and controlling finance is absolutely crucial. And I'll get back to that. So let me, let me talk about, so what, what is it that we can inject in this uh, to go further? Uh, Corbyn and McDonald in particular were critical of nationalized industries that weren't very democratic and they were right to do that. We have to see those few industries that are nationalized, not that many in the United States, but where they are, as experiments where we really try to learn how you can do this in a democratic way where the workers have a special role because of their uh, specificity in, in running these industries but we're all, you're also running it in terms of the interests of the community and the national interest. Uh, but where we don't have the capacity and the political power to actually extend nationalization very much, we should take a look at our social services. There are twice as many people employed in social services like education, 
health and uh, uh, welfare programs than there are in manufacturing. We should be talking about and thinking through what would it really mean to democratize those services? Uh, how would we make them into uh, having a relationship to the users through councils of some kind that could really bring us to the point of saying, well, we're actually changing the state because we're, we're, uh, we're, we're finding a new way of democratically linking workers, unions, and uh, the users. So that's critical in terms of uh, transforming the state, but it's also critical because there can be a great danger for public sector workers who see a favorable government to just see as an opportunity to act in their own interest. So it's also about transfer, transforming them. Uh, on the question of the banks, uh, raising the question of banks becoming a public utility, as Leo has been trying to do for a few decades, I think, is absolutely fundamental, even when we don't have an, uh, you know, we don't think we can actually win it yet. The only way we can win it is to get it on the agenda and start discussing it so it's someplace that we're pointing to. And what, it can, what we can do in the interim is think about uh, every time there's a crisis, banks get all these funds, they're bailed out. There should be a, pre, a quid pro quo. Why isn't there a levy on all banks that we could use for creating a couple of particular public banks that are run on different principles, that have the funds so they don't have to compete, that are addressing infrastructure, that are addressing uh, a Green New Deal? That would be critical. And then there's a question of starting, starting in some way to move on capital controls. We cannot let the banks get the message as they did after the great financial crisis and get the message again that they can get these kinds of, uh, this kind of support from the public. And then when things return to normal, they can just say, well, that was nice. Now we think we can leave. That can't happen. Uh, we need a wealth tax. And I, and I want to make a couple of points about this. Uh, the case for a wealth tax is not hard to make given the, uh, you know, 1% of the population in the U.S. having more than 90%, uh, uh, more than wealth in the uh, bottom 90%. Uh, in Canada, it's something like 5% of the population has more wealth in the bottom 90%. Uh, looking at the wealth tax, looking at the, uh, at, at the question of how uh, this reproduces intergenerational inequalities, looking at how much uh, the inequalities have grown since 1980s when they were already unequal, it's not hard to make the case for that. Part of the reason for doing this is because it's a political point, a little bit like uh, uh, Occupy. It's a point about keeping the question of inequality right up front on the agenda, how unequal the society is and how committed we are to doing something about it. Wealth tax would just be the start. Uh, you, you, you cannot let people make the kind of wealth they have and then think that you can then take it away after you've legitimated them making it. So you can do something quite significant. It's happened during war times when there were top tax rates of 94% after the Second World War where there were excess profits tax. You can do those things, but you eventually have to talk about the structure of production. But I do want to raise one thing that I don't think the left talks about enough. And it's a tricky question. And that is that if you're going to have the kind of social programs we want, you have to talk about taxing workers as well. The, one of the points about a wealth tax is that you're leveraging all the money from the wealthy so you can make a case for uh, workers with middle uh, income uh, to say that, yes, you're going to be taxed, but A, you're going to get it, uh, it's going to leverage a lot of money from the wealthy. But the other point is that you're trying to shift culturally from an emphasis on individual com consumption so if you, have, if you pay taxes, you have less money for individual consumption, but there are going to be more funds for, pub, for collective consumption. It's a socialist principle, but it's also crucial to the question of the environment. On the environment, uh, I, I think that the angle of emphasizing conversion gives us uh, a real significant strategic point about addressing a whole host of issues. If we're really gonna address the environment, it's not just a question of slowing things down, it's a question of fixing things. We need the material base to change everything about how we live, work, travel, play. 
we need a manufacturing capacity. And when we see plants closing because corporations don't want to invest or can make profits later, we should be jumping in and saying they're still productive, they still have great uh, equipment, they're skilled workers, they should be converted to useful production. And what that starts getting us into is raising the question of property rights that should be taken over in terms of uh, public ownership. It gets into the question of you need to plan if you're going to deal with the environment, but if you're going to talk about conversion, you need to plan. It gets into the question of workers whistleblowing if their plants are being run down and they can think of something better to do there. It gets into the question of why not think about conversion even in terms of things that are out there that we shouldn't be making, even though that is dif more difficult. It gets into the question of setting up a national conversion agency, transforming the state in terms of that kind of capacity and having regional hubs where hundreds of young engineers are thinking about what could be made, what do people need, how do we convert places to this, what new technology do we need, what do we have to develop in terms of our productive capacity? Uh, it means that we can plug in all kinds of other things at the regional level in terms of how health is run or how uh, food is uh, administered and produced. So, and, and even with co-ops, the limit of co-ops is that they can just become businesses like other businesses, uh, with some exceptions where people are doing it simply for a, a different lifestyle. But the potential of co-ops is if they're actually part of something that is a political movement where they see themselves as part of a political movement, not a, a business that is on the margins trying to do something different, uh, that is running educationals to give people both skills on running businesses, but also political education. Then you can imagine co-ops also being part of a plan that includes the state looking at procurement to support them or looks to unions agreeing to support them because of their pol politics, not because they will save a few cents on it, but because you're contributing to so something. So it, it is so crucial that we get out of this mode of competition and think through what are the mechanisms before we have everything taken over that we can begin to do those things. Now, I just want to conclude with the most important thing, because the most important thing, again, isn't at the level of policies. Policies are ways to raise questions. They're ways to, to uh, do some education. They're ways to even talk about the limits of what we're doing so that people see, yes, we can get some things, but if we really want to go further, we, we have to challenge things more. There's no way out of that. But what we really need to do is to think about how we engage the working class. Uh, that's one of the advantages of conversion. You can actually look at specific things and say and, and deal with workers who are losing their jobs or thinking about losing their jobs and talk concretely about what you might do. But generally for the DSA, the critical question is how do we once again get embedded in a working class? How do we uh, engage them in struggles and developing their capacities and the cultural changes? Uh, and I think this is more possible than it's been for a long time because the pandemic opened all kinds of questions. Uh, capitalism was already losing a lot of legitimacy before the pandemic. Leo and I have argued that this question of the legitimacy, legitimacy of capitalism was the real crisis that had to be addressed, not a crisis of accumulation. And that because it wasn't being addressed, there was all kinds of delegitimation of political institutions, the judiciary, the police, uh, the welfare bureaucracy, and of course, political parties. The pandemic increased that delegitimation and that creates an opening. And in this period after the pandemic and seeing now that there are some struggles emerging around questions like health and safety, uh, I think that's uh, absolutely critical. I just noticed looking at my notes, I left out one important thing, which I just want to flag. Obviously the question of uh, addressing, uh, strengthening the labor movement is fundamental. If we really want to talk about how we're going to do things, just in policy terms, aside from this question of engaging them in struggles and uh, being embedded to the labor movement, uh, we have to strengthen the labor movement. And I've always been skeptical about just saying uh, we have to make it easier for unions to organize. Because when unions were strong, it, we, you know, we had a reasonable amount of density in the US, uh, they still stumbled in terms of fighting against uh, free trade, uh, in, in terms of thinking in class terms, 
And the trade union movement in Canada right now has almost doubled the density of the United States. And uh, in spite of that, the, all the energy that uh, we see is actually in the US. The reason for why pushing the Democrats to put this legislation in about making it easier for unions to unionize, including other progressive uh, labor legislation like secondary boycotting and anti-scab legislation, is the labor movement has to be convinced that this is a unique moment when it can do something. That it's got a certain empathy after, you know, the, the move towards frontline workers, that with the Democrats coming back, this is something that they are really owed, and this is the moment that they have to seize. And if they don't do that, they really are going to continue their slide. And if they do do it, they're going to have to look back on history on how it's done, because it has to be a crusade. The miners in the 30s decided that they had to organize steel and they put 100 people into the field. Unions are going to have to decide that organizing is the main thing that they can do. The opportunities are there with unorganized workers. And if they do this, it means that there will be uh, new leaders emerging. It means that unions will begin to transform themselves because they'll have to change how they bring their workers into these kinds of struggles, uh, where they put their resources. Uh, it's going to mean that the union movement is going to get new blood from new places that are going to be very excited when they get a new union. And it's going to mean that we're going to get a lot of potential sources of power. Uh, having a union at places like Walmart and Amazon matter very much. I'll stop there. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Leo and Sam, for sharing your thoughts. Um, so we're going to enter into uh, the Q&A section. So we already have uh, quite a few questions, but if you want to ask a question of Leo and Sam, please feel free to put it into the Q&A option on Zoom. Uh, so the first question uh, that we're going to start off with is one from Brandon. Um, and Brandon talks about how your book promises a sort of like middle path between social democracy and Leninism, namely a long-term project of building workers' power within existing state institutions so as to transform them from within. And what Brandon's wondering is, what does that look like concretely? And how is this approach different in practice from the kind of classic social democratic approaches of, say, for instance, the German SPD? You want us to take these one by one, I guess. Well, um, uh, insofar as it promises a middle path, I'm not sure it, it does, a, it promises a different path, I think. Um, then, then it isn't the same as social democracy. Um, one needs to remember, first of all, that Lenin was a leader of a social democratic party. Um, and his model was the German Social Democratic Party and uh, uh, its leader, Kautsky. Uh, it was only in World War I that there was a sharp break, although there were, of course, differences and divisions inside the Social Democratic movement before 1914. Um, it, it's really not a matter of, you know, saying that there is a given abstract strategy. Uh, there are changing historical conditions. Uh, I don't think the Russian Revolution was made because of what ideas were in Lenin's head. Uh, his instinct, his political momentary instinct in the context of certain political conditions was very sharp. But it's not a matter of having this model of reformist gradualism versus that model of uh, uh, revolutionary insurrection. It's more a matter of what are the conditions today, the political conditions today. And in the context of the political conditions today, uh, it seems to me manifoldly the case that however irrational, disorganized, uh, uh, capitalism is, uh, the insurrectionary possibilities, even when production ceases, as it is at the moment, are incredibly narrow. 
Uh, so one has to, therefore, have some sort of a strategy for getting into the state. Uh, and, you know, parties in that sense can be more or less elitist, more or less vanguardist, but insofar as one thinks that Leninism is promising, because it does develop very capable cadre, very highly educated and organizationally skilled cadre, uh, to imagine that uh, those cadre organizations, if they were elected into the state, have a handmade strategy for democratizing it when their parties are not democratic um, is an illusion. Uh, there's no question that uh, insofar as the traditional uh, electoral strategy has been social democratic or has been Euro-communist, which is essentially the same as social democratic, has been for the last 30, 40 years. Uh, that too does not offer a transformative strategy. What we're witnessing, what we witnessed with uh, uh, Corbyn and Sanders was an awareness of this. And it's not a matter of us having a recipe, a new middle way recipe. It's more a matter of what lessons we learn from the struggles you are engaged in inside the Democratic Party. Uh, and that's what we're trying to think through, that's what we're trying to contribute towards. Um, insofar as there's a recognition, as Sam was saying at the end, that whatever you do inside the Democratic Party, however great your victories at a local level, at a state level, or, or above that, in terms of electing DSA people, the most crucial thing, however, is how that contributes to developing the confidence, the organizing capacities, new class formation in the United States. Uh, those who are elected need to continue to see that as their primary responsibility. Their accountability needs to be defined in those terms, much more than in terms of uh, what policies do they put uh, at a city council level. It's not to say the policies aren't important, but they need to be put with that in mind. So it's a process of discovery that we're embarked on. I don't think it's going to turn out to be a third way. Uh, I think it's going to transcend the limits, which were historically given anyway, of Leninism and of social democracy. Uh, Sam, if you want to go ahead, you're welcome. I, I, I just don't want to take up too much time, but if you if if you think that, so should I go ahead? Yeah, that okay, works. I just just short. I, you know, I mean, one of the interesting things about what Leo and I have been saying, and writing, uh, is that we didn't end with this question of uh, should you leave the Labour Party, or should you leave the Democratic Party. What we focused on is what should people in momentum and the DSA do. And it seems that what their historical responsibility is, is to say capitalism has made a certain kind of working class. Uh, you know, it didn't just happen. And uh, as Leo's written elsewhere, uh, Demo social democratic parties were part of that making. We're really trying to rethink uh, how to remake the working class. And the crucial thing for uh, momentum and the DSA is the extent to which they can organize themselves to focus on that task. And that, you know, I think it's, it's, it has nothing to do with what social democracy, ha modern social democracy has been. And as Leo said, for historical reasons, um, it doesn't even seem like a choice. What else can you do right now but that? To talk about taking over the state and smashing, I mean, they, they just, those are just abstract without showing that this can be done. So um, kind of along related lines, um, uh, talking about this idea of 
you know, once we've actually gotten into the state. Um, so we have a question here from David who asks that, or mentions that in the past socialist parties and leg uh, in legislatures, they've had to make alliances and coalitions with non-socialist parties in order to pass uh, pro-worker legislation. So um, how can a socialist party actually avoid losing this focus on transformation beyond capitalism if it has to work with uh, groups that uh, their goals actually differ with? That's a, that's a really key uh, strategic question. Um, and it goes to show in that respect uh, that the issue is not just about trying to change the Labour Party or the Democratic Party. This is a problem that the explicitly socialist Marxist new parties that were created uh, in, in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece, uh, in Germany, uh, now confront. Uh, and they're not necessarily doing very well at it, uh, as they are in governing coalitions uh, or, or working towards them while cooperating with uh, parties that are not. Well, look, essentially the problem is the same either way. What you have uh, is a, a, a layer of political representatives who are career politicians. Whether they're inside the Democratic Party as such, inside the Labour Party as such, uh, or whether they are in other parties you need to compromise with. Uh, most of them uh, believe in their bones that are ambitions for transcending capitalism with a democratic socialism is a dangerous chimera. Uh, and any compromise you'll engage with them in around this or that policy, uh, they will always play down uh, the transformative element uh, in your ambitions uh, for that policy as a building block towards transcending capitalism. Uh, they will see it as a means of stabilizing the system, making it more manageable. Uh, indeed, making a case for it to the ruling class and to the bureaucracy that unless you do this, you're gonna have social unrest. Right? Whereas we in fact are trying to promote social unrest of a productive kind. Right? Uh, not of a entirely negative kind, not of one that leaves barbershops burning and doesn't take it anywhere, uh, but is oriented to lighting a fire under those who are committed to social transformation and state transformation. So there is no recipe for how to handle this dilemma that Sam spoke to right at the beginning of his talk. That is that giant steps are impossible. Small steps are in danger of being co-opted. And what I, David is identifying is the first mechanism of co-optation, the one that exists in the legislature. Of course, it also exists when it already passes as policy, no matter how radical. And then the problem of implementation arises. Uh, and, and there's no recipe answer for this except what you're doing now with this type of educational program is a contribution to getting past that dilemma. Being aware of it as a strategic problem, being honest with those you mobilize about that problem, making them not oblivious to the problem, but super sensitive to the problem, is the first place to start. Uh, and, and more than that, I can't say. I mean, it, it's a matter of discovery, again. 
Uh, th thank you. Um, so I think what we're going to do for our, unless Sam, you wanted to add something to that. No, no, that was, okay. That was very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we have a few questions here talking specifically about Syriza's failures. So uh, we have a question here from Traven that I'm also adding elements from another question. Um, and it says that in your book, you make the case uh, for Syriza to have not given in to de the demands for austerity um, that were being imposed by the European Union. Um, but to have not given in to those would have uh, resulted in the Greek people having to go through years of even harsher po uh, poverty and that there would even be some somewhat of a similar phenomenon happening in the event of Corbyn or Sanders uh, taking power. Um, uh, particularly uh, in the book, you talk a lot about uh, ca capital flight. Um, so what are some of the solutions that you would pose to these specific dilemmas? Well, yeah, go ahead, Leo. Do you know what I want to answer that? Pardon me? Do you want to? I was no, no, giving you the opportunity. If I want to add something, I'll add. Go ahead. Okay. Um, To take the series of case concretely, uh, the left that were most critical of them, who argue that they didn't have a plan B uh, if they couldn't convince the European Union uh, to give them more rope in terms of breaking with austerity. Uh, and that plan B was to leave uh, the Eurozone. Uh, this was what you heard inside Greece uh, and inside a wing of, of Syriza itself and from much of the international left was they didn't have a plan B. The problem was that this international left were dishonest about the plan B. Their plan B was to leave the Eurozone and introduce and, and, and just leave the Eurozone. But leaving the Eurozone would have required both import controls and capital controls. And that would have meant that Greece would have been ejected from the European Union. Uh, had Syriza ever run uh, for office promising to leave the European Union, and the vast majority of Syriza members and leaders uh, were, are, think of themselves as European, would never have done that, not always on good grounds. Uh, since they don't want to be associated with uh, uh, the Balkans uh, on, on, on what is often ethnically superior terms. But in any case, uh, had they offered to leave the European Union as part of what they were, their politics was, they never would have been elected. Uh, they never would have gotten more than 5 to 10 percent of the vote. Uh, so th the, if the left was going to have a strategy that would take them that far, you would also have to have a strategy of convincing the Greek people, convincing the majority of the Greek working class that this is where this would take you. Uh, and beyond that, you would have had to have a strategy of making it clear uh, that uh, carrying that through would entail a much greater austerity in a context where there was no Soviet Union to rely on uh, uh, for a considerable period of time. Uh, and we were therefore as critical of the radical left as we were of the series of leadership uh, for not themselves thinking through what their plan B would have amounted to. Uh, there is, of course, a general lesson here, which I guess Trayman is getting at. Uh, and this brings us back to what we're really engaged in when we advance policy and when we get elected into the state. Uh, and, and that is that the small steps 
can be secured with the kinds of compromises that David was talking about without necessarily an enormous amount of economic cost being imposed on the society. The large steps will necessarily entail an attempt at capital strike, an investment, capital flight, investment strikes, uh, sabotage. There's no sense pretending otherwise. Uh, and this can involve considerable economic disruption. So if one is going to be able to carry those through, to get to the point one can carry those through, people who have elected you, who support you, who are in the streets for you, need to be aware that this is a process that can be materially costly for them. Every successful strike goes through this at a micro level. Every successful strike involves families and communities, not just the strikers, being perfectly aware that they are going to suffer materially for a period right, to a greater end. And even if that greater end doesn't necessarily leave them more wages and benefits, if you really had a good strike, you come out of it with a consciousness that it has left us with greater power and solidarity. Well, the same thing applies at the level of the state. Um, yeah, I, I just want to add a couple of things. I, I mean, one thing in soberly looking at this, uh, the idea that a small country in Europe that was so dependent on Europe and had been so integrated uh, through the European Union, being able to carry through a revolution, a socialist revolution, if, if that's what it meant, uh, without international support was a critical factor. I mean, you know, if, if people were rioting all over Europe in support of Greece and screwing Greece, that would have been a different thing. But to have expected this to happen, and then the crucial point uh, that Leo made, there was no base for uh, support for leaving uh, Europe. So I think the two main things that Leo were trying to say in our analysis of Greece is one that simply, you know, it's what Leo started his introduction with. Making this into a blame game is a way of avoiding all the difficult questions socialists have to really raise. We have to start off by appreciating how difficult this was so we can start theorizing about what was really possible to do or maybe not possible to do. And the second thing is, and this really pertains to the, social, the education you're doing, socialist consciousness in terms of the working class means that uh, they are prepared for the risks that this will involve. If we think that we're going to win people to socialism simply by telling them, don't worry, when we take over, it'll all be wonderful. We'll just redistribute income, etc. That's There is going to be difficult transitions and people have to be, that's part of what education is about, is about being honest with them. And I go one step further. There's, there's a certain uh, section of the left that thinks that uh, when capitalism is falling apart, it is easy to win people over. And that's not at all obvious. On the one hand, people may say, I just want capitalism fixed. I'd rather go back to a certain kind of normality. And the main point is to really win people over to socialism, you have to convince them that even when capitalism is working fine on its terms, it's not the kind of society we want. And, and those are the really difficult educational tasks, I think. Thank you for that. Um, and to maybe this will maybe be our last question. We might have time for one more. Um, to tie it into the current moment, like here in America, particularly, a lot of the energy and organizing on the left is um, surrounding um, protesting and direct action against police brutality in our American cities. Um, and particularly a lot of organizers there drawing on the, um, drawing on the rich tradition of police and prison abolitionist uh, work and scholarship. 
uh, to bring forward some sort of radical transformation of coercive state apparatuses. Um, so since you, you all are talking about um, these strategies of democratic state transformation, uh, do you see this abolitionist framework as being compatible with the stuff that you lay out in your work? Yes, it, it's conceivable that after the moment of a shift from protest to politics, that Syriza and Podemos and the DSA and Momentum, the World Transformed, represented, that we're now in the wake of their limitations, uh, seeing a return uh, from, pro from politics to protest. Uh, one could almost already see that on the horizon with Extinction Rebellion uh, at the beginning of 2019. Almost a sense on the part of the young people who were enthused, so enthused by Corbyn and how well he did in securing the greatest increase in the Labour Party's vote uh, from one election to another since 1945 in 2017. One could almost sense that they realized that the barriers inside the Labour Party were such that he was losing by 2019. And they were returning, especially given the scale of the environmental crisis, to politics in the streets. And I suppose some people could interpret the current moment that way. Neither of those things are negative. Uh, uh, there is no sense in thinking that the shift from protest to politics is about there not being protest. Uh, it's rather that the two are in, in, a, in a synergistic way operating together. And I have the feeling as I watch what has gone on this summer, that it is synergistic rather than alternative. That it doesn't have the determined anarchist element that was present in the anti-globalization movement, change the world without taking power. In fact, the very call for defunding the police is a call for state action. And what I think is interesting about it is that it is a call, it is a call which can be and should be interpreted for policy implementation to be discussed, not just policy to be discussed. That is, what is being said in these protests is that the policies introduced that make police accountable, given the current structure of the repressive apparatus, will never be successful without a restructuring of the coercive apparatus. I think it's our responsibility, those of us who are part of that, support it, but are also very active in trying to sustain an, a strategy for getting into the state, not just making demands on it from the outside. Right? It is our responsibility to pick up the kinds of things Sam was talking about. That is, okay, if one's going to restructure uh, community policing, does one do that through the development of a new system of councils, of elected councils in cities, uh, in, 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 uh, counties, uh, is that what is necessary in order to make that apparatus accountable, right? Um, of course, it does involve shifting as far as possible uh, what public uh, uh, employees do, and police are public employees, although part of the demand is, of course, to do away with the privatization of repressive apparatuses. Um, shifting what public employees do so that it is supportive of users, as Sam was saying, right? Rather than the dispensers of state power. 
whether that state power is, you know, a money grant to a uh, uh, woman on welfare, or whether that state power is a billy club, or indeed a taser or a gun, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it links up with the kinds of ideas Sam was raising about how do you democratize apparatuses. Now, I don't think that most of the leadership of Black Lives Matter is thinking this way. I may be wrong, and it would be very interesting to see uh, them articulate this in these terms. Um, and, and it would be, I think, a great advance in getting beyond the movement versus party uh, dichotomy, which has so bedeviled American politics throughout its history. Right? Um, and, and I think it's incumbent upon them to try to start doing this. Uh, but I, you know, I think it's possible. Uh, and, and I think it's DA, DSA's responsibility to do all it can to make it possible. Uh, and in that sense, a piece in the New York Times this Sunday, which you might see is very Pollyannish, uh, called The Left is Remaking Politics uh, by uh, Amna Akbar, uh, who makes this case and adduces somebody I referred to earlier in my talk, Andre Gortz, and his notion of structural reforms, non-reformist reforms. Uh, you know, I think that's what he was reaching for. In that, in that piece. And the fact that it appears in the, in the New York Times doesn't mean they're gonna support it in the end, but it gives us a legitimacy, it gives you a legitimacy. That is, shit, this was even said in the New York Times, right? Uh, which is not anything to sneeze at when it comes to uh, engaging in uh, uh, political discourse. Sam, did you have any additions you wanted to make to that? Sorry. OK. Um, I guess one of the questions in watching this develop is whether we're seeing uh, something about class formation taking place when we watch this, that the kind of support uh, for Black Lives Matter and for these protests uh, by whites, especially young people, but not just young people, is quite remarkable. And one of the things that's always divided uh, the working class in the U.S. has been the question of black, white, and race. And, you know, to the extent that this morphs into not just being about police brutality, but about conditions in poor and working class black communities, uh, it begins to raise the kind of demands about education and health um, and, and uh, decent jobs and unionization that to start talking about, well, how do you actually change this means you have to have an alliance between black and white workers. And the trick is to do that without subsuming the question of race to just class, to say that if we're actually gonna have a serious class alliance, then we have to struggle for the equality of everybody in that class and taking on the question of race alongside of it. Uh, thank you much. Uh, I, I especially appreciated just, uh, I, I especially appreciated you guys, uh, you know, recognizing the progress um, being made in in these movements, and you know, speaking to my experiences in Omaha, I definitely agree that there is some sort of the dichotomy between movement and like party or organization is starting to flatten a little bit, at least in my experiences with what's going on uh, here in Omaha. But uh, I wanted to thank you guys so much for joining us today, and uh, just a big thank you for that talk and sticking around to answer questions. Great, it's good to do. Very happy to do this. And, and all we can say is best of luck. <laughs>